started, I'd like to introduce our next presenter, Jen Heater. Jen is a patient advocate living with chronic migraine and chronic pain. She worked for more than 15 years in government affairs and public policy before migraine and chronic pain forced her to leave her career behind. But rallying for causes has long been a part of Jen's life and turning her illness into advocacy has been a gratifying transition. Jen has a bigger resume than I do, I think. She's pretty impressive. She's the Director of Resources and Advocacy for My Chronic Brain, which is an online magazine for chronic migraine sufferers. She's a part of Chronic Migraine Awareness as the Director of the ARMS Program. Um, she's on the Disparities and Headache Advisory Council, uh, the ECHO program. She volunteers with Miles for Migraine and the USP Foundation. Um, without further ado, here is Jen Heater. Thank you, Eileen, and thank you so much for having me here. Thank you to everyone involved with Retreat Migraine for all the hard work they've put into making sure we have a great experience. We are living in strange times and I'm thankful now more than ever for this amazing community because I've met so many wonderful people and have found support systems that I needed, especially as we deal with the stress and confusion going on in the world right now. And so many of my connections were made or solidified last year at Retreat Migraine. Here's a little bit about my story. My story doesn't begin with migraine disease, but it did start in my head. When I was a senior in college, I was diagnosed with a rare disease called Cushing's disease. It was around the same time that I noticed an increase in my episodic migraine. Cushing's disease, in my case, is caused by a pituitary tumor. The pituitary is a small but important gland, so important they call it the master gland, and it sits right behind your eye. So in 2000, at UCSF, I had my first brain surgery to remove my tumor and cure my Cushing's. Unfortunately for me, the darn tumor kept coming back, resulting in surgeries in 2000 and 2015. The surgery in 2000 was the tipping point for my migraine journey. Because of nerve damage to my face, I became chronic. One day early on, not too long after one of my surgeries, while my immune system was still depressed, I had to go to the emergency room because I was living in a new city and I had spiked a fever and had a pounding earache. A young intern came in and took my history, getting very excited during the process because here I was a textbook case of a disease he had only heard of. She attempted to look in my ear and after five or six po painful pokes, she could see nothing wrong. Looking at me, she said, well, you really are a medical oddity, aren't you? I was sick in pain and felt helpless. I knew something was wrong. Why couldn't she see it? Then I burst into tears. She ran and got her attending who took one look at my ear and schooled her intern because I had an obvious raging ear infection and it wasn't hard to see. But her words stuck with me and I decided to make them mine because when I read the list, list of side effects on a new medicine, I know I'm going to have most of them. When it comes to illness, my body seems to say, go big or go home. My doctors know I'm a difficult case, but as I like to remind them, I'm not sick, I'm medically complex. But I've learned that a good doctor patient relationship is one that goes both ways and is just one of the many places that we can advocate for ourselves and for others living with migraine disease. Migraine runs in my family. Nearly every wom woman on my mother's side of the family experiences them and my brother gets them as well. And I first began experiencing them when I was in my late teens. For many years, I was able to control the, these episodic migraines through the use of triptans, but as I became chronic, the disease became too much for me to handle. In my case, the pain hits on one side of my face. It's a sharp, stabbing burn, accompanied by intense photophobia, nausea, and alternating flashes of hot and cold. It was hard for me to drive because I never knew if I was going to have an attack and be stranded. And some of my medications had side effects that make me uncomfortable and unwilling to get behind a car after I had taken them. 
And many of these attacks lasted weeks or days or even months, no matter what the doctor threw at them. I was living in Los Angeles, working at full time at a job I loved in an industry and position that I had worked hard to finally attain. Things probably looked okay from the outside, but the seams were coming apart more quickly than I was willing to admit. I had been on my own since I was 18 years old, but since my health had started to deteriorate, my parents had started switching, flying down and helping me with basics, shopping, laundry, picking up prescriptions and taking me back and forth to the growing plethora of doctor's appointments. Chronic migraine was a huge part of the reason I was forced to leave my career behind. In 2014, I had to relocate because I was no longer able to live on my own. Not really where I had expected to be, at th to be 36 and living back with my parents. My par parents are wonderful, but the loss of independence is definitely a blow. Two years later, I was let go from my job because I just wasn't able to fulfill the duties anymore. And I uh, filed for unemployment. I had put so much of myself into building a career in government relations. So losing that job was a huge loss to me because I felt like it defined so much of who I was. We often talk about grieving our old lives when we become chronically ill, and I grieved this one for a long time. Katie Golden talks about the concept of the migraine thief, and that is the perfect way to describe it. In the span of seven years, I had lost my independence, my career, and a big piece of my sense of self, stolen by the migraine thief. But here's the thing, advocacy saved me. I was in a place where I was in pain and had just lost a huge part of my identity. I spent many days in what I call my cave, my dark, quiet bedroom, pillow over my head, blackout curtains on the window, scared to move, fearing the slightest twinge would cause the burning stake of pain behind my eye make my head explode. But the moments when the pain wasn't sky high, when it would begin to abate, I was restless. I knew I had to fill the holes where my old life had been, so searching for, I was searching for a way to fill my time. Because even though I felt pained and broken, for the most part, my mind was still working. My brain, brain and brain fog notwithstanding, I still had the skills and I had words, worked so hard to hone during my career. I also desperately needed connection with others, others who know what it felt and knew the shorthand migraine lingo that we all learned so, to speak so fluidly. My first outlet was writing. While I was employed, I was, not, I was open about my illness, but not so much online. So I started blogging and became very active about my illness on social media in a way I felt previously unable. I joined a group called Chronic Illness Bloggers as a way to extend my reach and volunteer to help in their community. My first time sharing my story with a wide audience was a little intimidating, but ultimately very powerful. My 20 year high school reunion was coming up and I was in no shape to attend. So I decided to write about why I wasn't coming and had the story published on The Mighty, a website for people with chronic illness and disability. From there, I shared it on Facebook and in our little online reunion group, and the response was very empowering. So many people reached out to tell me things that they were struggling with or people they knew that had gone through something similar. Telling your story is a powerful thing. We have all gone through so many different battles with migraine, from managing pain and the myriad of symptoms that go along with it, to losing jobs, relationships, and navigating prior authorizations, battling insurance companies, and trying to make, trying multiple medications and treatments to control the disease. For me, speaking about what happened allowed me to slowly begin to move forward. There are many organizations that encourage you to tell their story, including these on the screen. And you'll hear a lot about them um, in the coming days. When I started my advocacy journey, I also began connecting online with other people that spoke about having migraine. Don't get discouraged if it takes you a while to find the right group. Sometimes you have to try a few to find the one that clicks. In mid 2018, a friend of mine approached me with a small group of us with an idea. 
Amanda and I had met a few years prior on Twitter, but had bonded very quickly over migraine and chronic illness. And she was frustrated at the lack of resources in one place for people with chronic migraine. She wanted to create an online magazine that would provide scientific information, patient stories and advocacy and more. I immediately responded, I'm in. And soon after my chronic brain was born and I was in charge of resources and advocacy. Being part of my chronic brain was a major turning point for me. I was part of a team again, writing pieces about advocacy and interviewing organizations that work in the migraine space. Even better, my team was made up exclusively, almost exclusively of people with migraine. So there was an understanding when it came to scheduling meetings and the flexibility of deadlines. It is no easy task starting a self funded magazine from nothing, but doing something for cause you love has always been so motivational for me. And it had been sorely missing in my life. Don't get me wrong. There were days when the memories in my Facebook feed popped up and reminded me of how my old life used to be. And I still grieved it. But now that I had something to actively work on and advocate with, I felt so much more at peace with my life, even if it was still filled with pain. My chronic brain is going to its third year and working on this amazing project has opened up an even greater platform for me to advocate in, including Chronic Migraine Awareness Inc., which is a fantastic organization. As Eileen mentioned, I am now the director of CMA's advocacy program, ARMS, which stands for Advocates Removing Migraine Stigma. The ARMS program is comprised of advocates that work to educate and empower others in their own communities, doctors' offices, and anywhere they know that would make a difference. Advocates are provided all the materials they need to reach out and make a difference. Advocacy, when you say advocacy to people, their minds go to the political, stomping around the halls of Congress and rallying behind legislation. Yes, those are all vital part, vitally important parts, but they are only a small piece of the advocacy puzzle. At My Chronic Brain, we work with artists that express themselves through photography, painting, and various other mediums to show the world what migraine looks like. That's advocacy. <laughs> One of our edit editors suffers, suffers from vestibular migraine and has found extreme benefit to controlling her migraine through cooking. And she puts out recipes to the community, tasty advocacy. And you can see her panel on Saturday night, Alicia Cook. Alicia Wolf, sorry, the dizzy cook. Wearing a shirt or a pin or something out in the community and starting a conversation about migraine with others about the disease is advocacy too. I can't tell you how many times I've been wearing this button or one of my migraine slogan t-shirts and someone comments, oh, I have, a, I have migraine or my sister, aunt, friend has migraine. So I pull out a card and tell them we have a great community and tons of resources. Tell them to reach out. Advocacy can be the simple act of making that connection. Our in-person contacts are limited. The one benefit I have found from this whole terrible situation that so many things have gone online and have given those of us that might not be able to attend a chance to join in. So attend that conference, that training, or join that lecture. And never discount the impact of social media. I know that even under normal circumstances, there are many days it's hard for me to get out and about, but there are always messages that need to be spread to other members of the migraine community. Whether it's making these personal connections, tweeting your members of Congress about the importance of increased funding for headache specialists, or making a post about upcoming CMA Miles for Migraine events or US Pain educational Zooms. Getting started can seem daunting, but you've already taken the first step. You're part of Retreat Migraine event. Take a look at the partner organizations to see how you can get involved and find out about the other programs they offer. And right now in this crazy time in our world, many migraine organizations have patient-centered COVID resources, support groups, and ways to deal with treatments getting canceled, insurance issues, and more. CHAMP has great resources, and so much of that will be discussed during the retreat. So what do I do for migraine now, and what have I tried? Like most of you, the answer is likely a lot and close to everything. Well, two weeks ago, <clears throat> I did my first inpatient stay for chronic pain at Stanford Hospital. So far, so good. It has taken my pain down from a nine to a six 
six, five, which is huge for me. Hospitalization during COVID is super weird, just like everything else, but I did feel very safe. How did I get to the point, to that point? Well, ketamine has been one of the few things that has controlled my pain. At home, I had been on tablet form, the nasal spray, and of course it's not perfect, but it does help take the edge off when things are very bad which has been most of the year. My pain is strange. It's like the battle of the wills between my migraine and my trigeminal neuralgia, sometimes both, which is lucky for me. I'm also on a few different preventative nerve medications and have been on Topamax for years. CGRPs and Botox didn't work for me. And so for now I try to move around when I can. Weighted pillows, I use the weighted hugaroo pillow over my face all the time. Ice once in a while, uh, peppermint essential oils for nausea and anxiety. It's a huge bag of tr tricks and it's constantly changing. A team of good doctors and a good communi communication is essential. And of course, so is the support of my family and friends. And speaking of things that cause me pain. So I've been in chronic pain since 2009. And now I'm just working to control it down to smaller numbers that on that dreaded pain scale. It's an ongoing process and some days are harder than others, but I keep going knowing that there are, there are always new things on the horizon. Some things I wanna stress before I wrap up, wrap, wrap up. Number one, advocacy is for everybody. You are unique, your story is unique, how you view the world is different from any, everybody else and you can make an impact in a myriad of different ways. Number two, there is room in this community for everyone. I have found this to be an incredibly welcoming community and there are many different organizations. It may take a while to find the right one for you, but don't let not click clicking with one group stop you. Just continue your search for the right one. No matter what your talent is, there is likely a group for you. One thing to remember is that these groups are, a lot of them are run by volunteers with migraines. So don't be alarmed if your request isn't answered immediately. It never hurts to follow up. Number three, don't forget to advocate for yourself. This is a big one. I am good at advocating for migraine and chronic migraine, but it is much harder for me to advocate for myself, but I'm getting better. Don't forget to speak up at the doctor and take time for self-care self when you need it. And number four, we all have something to contribute to advocacy. Your delivery system may just be different from mine. Whether you express yourself through writing, painting, speaking, graphic design, lobbying elected officials, designing migraine t-shirts, communicating on social media, or wearing purple migraine flare, your advocacy is important. What this all boils down to is that yes, migraine sucks, but there are things we can do to make an impact connect with others and positively affect your life. You've already taken the first step and there's a community of people out here cheering you on and ready to help you continue to amplify your voice. Migraine is tough, but together we are tougher. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jen, for sharing your journey with us. We really appreciate it and it was very impactful. Our coalition is working together to solve the challenge of migraine and headache diseases and support patients wherever they are on their patient journey. None of this would have been possible without the generous support of our sponsors who helped us bring Retreat Migraine to life digitally this year and support hope community, and advocacy at such an important time.